We're starting today a brand new series called Behold Your God. We're essentially studying some of the attributes of God. There's a statement I want to give to you to begin. And the statement is this. I've used this before. I think it's a powerful, helpful statement. Um, and the statement is this, that we become what we behold. If you think about it in your life uh, with kids, they tend to become like whatever they behold. So the environment uh, in the home tends to influence them. They become like the things that they see. They become like what they behold. We see with teenagers as well. And that's why if you're a teenager here, your parents are so hyper-focused on the things that you're beholding on social media and your influences around you. It's because we become what we behold. The things that we view and see and watch and interact with, they have an influence on us. We tend to become like those things. And so as we start this study on the nature, the character of God, we're reminded of this truth that we become like what we behold. The picture that we have of God, the conception we have of God, influences everything in our life. In fact, a number of years ago, there was a man named A.W. Tozier. I wrote a book called Knowledge of the Holy. And I want to give you one of the statements that he makes that I think helps us to see the significance of our understanding of God. He says this. He says, what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I don't know if you thought about that or not, but if we could personalize it, say it this way, that what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Whatever you believe about God is going to influence your behavior, it's going to influence your attitude. Your understanding of God is going to influence everything else in your life. And so we're asking this question in this series, what is God like? Now, I'll be honest with you, I would have been much more confident preaching this series when I was 23 years old, as opposed to being 43 years old today, because there's something about as we grow older in Christ, to understand more about the nature of God, there's this mysterious element to God where we understand we can't fully grasp Him. And in fact, I want to introduce kind of two terms that are going to help frame and humble us and give us an appropriate um, understanding of this study. The first fun word that I want to give you is the word inscrutable. Um, the word inscrutable, you can note this, it just means impossible to fully understand or interpret. And so we have to grasp that God is inscrutable. That is, He's impossible to fully understand or to fully interpret. The other fun word is, in addition to inscrutable, a uh, word that you might not have heard lately, is the word ineffable. And ineffable just means that it's too great for words. Like too great, not only for comprehension, but certainly too great for explanation. And so here we are beginning this study about this God who is so large and vast, we can't fully comprehend Him, but we do know this, God has revealed Himself. He's revealed Himself through Scripture, through the person of Jesus. So though we cannot know Him fully, we can know Him in part, and that's what we want to do because it has bearing on every element of our lives. Now, as we get started, I want to just speak briefly to this idea that there, there should be a division or more emphasis placed on practical matters. And the way I would say this is that, that we shouldn't focus on this word called orthodoxy. We should focus more on this thing called orthopraxy. And what that essentially means is that we shouldn't focus on doctrine. We shouldn't necessarily focus on theology. We should focus on practical matters. And here's one quote that's been popular lately that's made its way around social media circles. It says this, it says, Stop arguing about the rapture, translations, the trinity, spiritual gifts, and the shape of the earth, and go tell someone about Jesus. Now, we hear that on the front end, and there's part of me that says, Okay, we don't need to spend our time in ivory towers all the time debating heady intellectual topics. We do need to be practicing our faith, but I believe it's a, it's a false division to say that the, the church and individual followers of Christ just need to focus on practical matters and not worry about doctrine. Rightly understood, the doctrine of God is a beautiful, healthy, helpful thing to study and to embrace 
And so over against the idea that that theology theology could be kind of a passe thing, we really want to have depth. And my heart and soul, my heart desire for you is that you would have theological depth in terms of orthodoxy so that it will inform your orthopraxy. Essentially, what you believe about God influences how you behave in the world. There's a, a connection and a link between those two. And so we just want to say we want to embrace both. Now, with that said, as an introduction to the series, I want to turn now and introduce the message that I want to talk to you about today. The message I want to talk to you about today is an attribute of God that perhaps you've not heard of or you've not heard it verbalized, but this attribute of God is core to understanding all of the other attributes of God, and it helps inform a right understanding of who He is. And so if you open with me, we're going to look at three scriptures. And these are essentially, we're looking at kind of proof texts that all move us in the same direction. They all point toward the same truth and the same reality as we understand this first attribute of God that we're going to study. The first text is Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I'll shortly reference two other scriptures. We'll have these up here on the screen. You can make note of these um, in your notes. So we begin Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. And so if you'll listen as I read these, be a detective and try to discern what the biblical writers are saying here about the attribute of God or the nature of God. So we see Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 is a pretty straightforward, clear explanation. For I, the Lord, do not change. Pretty clear. We go to James chapter 1, verse 17, and we find James saying, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom, listen, there is no variation or shifting shadow. And finally, the third verse is one that perhaps you have heard already. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, I need to uh, confess, I have a frustrating relationship with technology today. Uh, And and so I'm 43 years old, and what I find is that uh, technology is kind of this um, continually cumbersome, frustrating thing. Because about 10 years ago... I was influenced by some people that said, you really need to get on this thing called Facebook. Everybody is on Facebook, and it's a great way, it's a great platform to to influence other people. And so at at their behest, I said, okay, I'm going to take this plunge into Facebook. And Facebook was after this thing called MySpace. Anybody remember MySpace was the predecessor to this? Well, Facebook came along. Before it was Facebook, it was Face Mash, if you knew that or not. And so what's happened is Facebook was the thing for a while, but all of you know this. Like, here's the frustrating part. The only thing I'm on currently is Facebook, and essentially Facebook is moving to the side, and we've had some things since then called Twitter and Instagram. We now have this thing called TikTok, and Facebook is shifting to Meta, which is indicating they're moving toward this focus on the metaverse which if you understand that, props to you, it's very difficult to understand. And we see within technology, things are always shifting. They're always changing. And it can be a frustrating, unsettling reality trying to keep up with technology. And it's not just technology. It's I think about fashion. You know, I'm at this stage of life, and some of you can amen on one side or the other of this, where there are really two avoids, two extremes that I want to avoid one extreme I want to avoid is, dude, you're trying really too hard. Like, you might have worn that 25 years ago, but you don't need to wear that today. But it's not as simple as just avoiding that extreme, because there's another extreme. Uh, and the other extreme, not just the extreme of you're trying too hard, is this. You've just given up. Right? And so some of you, like you, would think our, your husbands need to be listening to this right now, because... Over the course of time, the more and more, you just want to give up. And it, it's frustrating. It can be unsettling to think about, how do I not fall into one of these two extremes? Because things are always changing. There's actually a law, the law of constant change, which essentially in psychology and physics and uh, several different fields, that 
that state that nature is always evolving, always shifting, always moving. Uh, there's Moore's Law, which at one time indicated that it basically talks about technology as in a uh, state of accelerated change. At one time, technology doubled about every 18 months, and now it's even quicker than that. And so you feel that in your own lives. You feel that within your families. You feel that within your church. There's part of you, and this kind of, uh, I guess, is a confession. There's part of me sometimes that I think, I wish, and I know this is is a statement that probably um, dates my uh, age of my soul, but there's part of me that wishes things could just stay the same. Right? I mean, within church, within, like if things could just stay the same. And I know I'm getting old if I think that way, but it's, it's a truth. And what we find in this is that, that change, change is destabilizing. Right? I mean, ch- change is it's unsettling. Change and the rapid state of change, as unsettling it is, causes us to want to find security in something, to to look to something that doesn't change, that doesn't shift, that is not going to be different in a week or a month or a year from now. And, And that's where we find this truth about God so powerful and relevant. This thing called immutability. And I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm introducing an attribute of God that maybe you've never heard of before, but it has direct bearing on all the other attributes of God that we're going to study today. Immutability essentially means this. God never changes. And I want to share that with you, my friends, as good news. Uh, One writer named A.W. Pink noted a number of years ago, he said, God cannot change for the better, for he is perfect. And being perfect, he cannot change for the worse. You see, if God is truly perfect and whole in himself, then there is never any need for him to shift or transform or in himself evolve in his being because he was, is, and will be the very standard of what is perfect. One man named D.H. Kuyper has rightly said that to deny the immutability of God is to deny that He is God. You see, if God is not immutable, that is, if He changes or shifts, um, He might be one type of God today, but then He becomes a different type of God tomorrow, and what that does is it, it exacerbates and it adds to the unsettledness that we feel if we can't know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think the old hymnal writer uh, Thomas Chisholm had it right when he said, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. In these great words, he continues on and says, There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. And in this great line, as thou hast been, thou forever will be. The three areas that God never changes, these are not exhaustive, but I want to give these to you just so you can have a frame of reference as to what we're talking about when we say God never changes. The first area that God never changes, we see God's nature God's nature is unchanging. Here's why that's significant. In the coming weeks, we're going to study the attribute of God's holiness and God's love and God's sovereignty and God's knowability, how He's revealed Himself. But in any of these attributes, if you take the attribute of God is love, that's kind of an anchor for us culturally today. But if you you divorce God's love from His immutability, you can have no security that God will be loving tomorrow, right? So if God is loving today, but He's not immutable, that is, He can change, He can be loving one day, capricious the next. God, if He can change or shift, we really don't have any basis to say, we know this is who God is today, tomorrow, and forever. And so we embrace that God's nature is unchanging. The second area, it really is linked into the third area that God doesn't change. Secondly, God's knowledge. God's knowledge does not change. 
So uh, God, because he is infinite and he is all-knowing, um, he doesn't learn new things. He doesn't grow in his wisdom. He doesn't kind of navigate humanity and figure out, oh, this is what they're doing. I need to respond to what's taking place here. And this is connected to his knowledge. It's connected directly to the third area where he does not change. And this is significant, and I'll point out why in just a moment. Not only does God's knowledge never change, but thirdly, God's purpose and plan is unchanging. Now, you might have heard this phrase uh, in different ways. It's been referred to as open theism. Uh, is one kind of theological stream. Some people have talked about uh, process theology. And even if you're not familiar with those terms, you're probably familiar with the teachings. The idea behind both of those is that um, God, uh, as He kind of navigates humanity, He changes depending on what He sees happening within the world. And so with open theism in particular, the idea is that God is open to changing and evolving as He sees the world progress. And they essentially say within open theism that if man is to truly be free, like our will is free, and if God knows everything, even the future then the future is predetermined. And they say, well, because man must be free and man's freedom requires that the future is not known, they say the future is unknowable even by God. And so there is this, um, again, it's phrased in different ways, but the idea that God's kind of growing up, God's learning as he goes along, as he deals with humanity, over and against that, I would just share with you the opinion that the writer, the prophet Isaiah had, as we go back to Isaiah chapter 46, I want to read this to you very briefly as kind of a brief rejoinder and response to open theism and this idea that God is shifting and changing. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 8, says, Remember this and be assured, recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is no one like me. Notice this, declaring the end... From the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. So when we say God is unchanging, we say that God is unchanging in His nature, in His knowledge, and in His purpose and plan. And so if we think about doctrine, who God is, we think about orthodoxy, how does that inform our practice, our orthopraxy? Well, there are two ways that you can take this and apply it to your life right now today. The first is that because God cannot change, it means You can be changed. And this is really good news. This is the the hope we have for transformation lies in the fact that God himself doesn't shift. He doesn't change. Uh, Paul will say it this way, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So Paul is saying here, as we behold this glory, we are transformed. Because God doesn't change, we can be changed. Now I know we've looked at several kind of um, new words, but two new words that we're going to talk about through this series are communicable attributes and incommunicable attributes. Uh, Incommunicable attributes of God are, are attributes that cannot be communicated or transferred to us. An example of that would be God's omniscience. Uh, He is all-knowing. His omnipotence. He's all-powerful. You and I are never going to arrive at a place where we're all-knowing or we're we're, we're, we're all-powerful. So there are incommunicable attributes, but there are also communicable attributes. And so things like God's holiness, God's love, God's mercy... God's patience are attributes that he possesses that can become ours. If we look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, that's a vision 
that God gives us as to what our lives can be marked by and look like, we can become more like Him in those areas. So because God's love is fixed, we can become more loving. Because God's hope is fixed, we can become more hopeful. Because God's grace is fixed, we can become more gracious. In every area, we see these communicable attributes of God. They can become part of who we are. And practically what that means is that in our our vocabulary, we need to minimize, if not eliminate, these two words. Always or never. If you have a tendency in your view of yourself or perhaps your view of others, where you say, I am always. Always, followed by something negative, or I will never, you know, achieve whatever it is. I will never overgrow this. Outgrow this. I will never overcome this. I, I will never move beyond this. What this shows us is that because God is unchangeable, you and I have hope for change. We have hope for transformation. And so that's the first practical takeaway we see here. The second way we can apply this, in addition to knowing that you can change, number two, is you can find security in God during insecure times. I'll share with you, being from Oklahoma, a number of things that are unique about that area, and we have a lot in common with eastern Colorado there, and that is that there are a lot of tornadoes. And so it's a common thing when we got ready to build a house there a number of years ago. We had somebody scoop out a large chunk of ground in our backyard and put in a cellar there. And for other families, what they will do if they don't put in a cellar when they're going to build a home, um, they'll create this thing called a safe room. And a safe room is just this place on a lower level of a home where they drill down as far as they can to find bedrock. They, they drill down to a place that no tornado, no weather event is ever going to touch or change or shift. They drill down to this place that is secure. And this safe room is anchored on this unchanging, unmovable rock. That if there's a, an F5 tornado that comes through, everything above that and around that is insecure everything above that and around that may be blown away but they have this certainty there is a place that is secure and here's one of the main takeaways i would just encourage you to think about who god is here ask yourself this question where do i find security Where am I looking right now to find a sense of security? With all of the chaos and the destabilization in the world and the accelerated rate of change, where am I looking? What is my safe room? You know, I thought about my own personal heart, my own personal life. There are several areas that I look to at times to to find stability and security and And some of those were as follows, and perhaps you can relate to these as well. Some areas I've looked to find uh, security and to have as a safe room. Political power, national security, personal freedom, money, retirement, health. Any number of those things. As we see the destabilization happening in the world... The temptation is for us to go to those things to find security. But inevitably, you already know this. But inevitably, what happens is when we go to those insecure things to find our security, we end up as insecure people. Now, doesn't this just make sense? That if we go to an insecure source to find security... What's going to come is we're going to be insecure people. If we go to political power to find our source of security, and not that we don't need to be involved in the political process, we absolutely do. I believe Christians need to be more involved than we currently are. But if we look to that area, to our national security or to personal freedom or to our bank account or our retirement, and we look and say, I'm going to to go to this place as a safe room. 
to just help, help my blood pressure go down, help my anxiety level go down. I'm going to look to this thing as a safe room to help me feel less anxious and less at peace. Inevitably, what's going to happen is the opposite result will occur. It may be the case that for a while you look to one of these things to find security and it promises you, it provides for you what it promises. But after a while, something's going to happen that's going to undermine the security of the economy, of your job, of your family, of your health. Something eventually is going to happen for every person who ever lives to help them see that, oh gosh, I've had my security in this, but this thing is no longer secure. And so what, what happens for a lot of us is that we live lives of constant insecurity. Going from one safe room to another to another when God himself has said, for I, the Lord, do not change. I, I have been aware of Russia and Ukraine before it ever happened. I've been aware of COVID. I've been aware of the stock market. And here is what, friends, we need to know. God is aware of what's going to happen tomorrow. He's not an evolving God who's figuring things out while he's on his throne. He's a God who is up there right now who knows what's going to happen next year. He's prepared for it. His plan and his purpose is inalterable. It's not going to change. And so for us, we need to take heart in that and to realize there's a safe room. And the safe room is not my retirement. The safe room is not whatever political party is in power. My, my safe room is not any of those things that are transitory and subject to change with time and the whims of fallen people. My safe room is God, my Father, who is on His throne. I love the way one writer named Sam Storms said it. He said, what all this means, very simply, is that God is dependable. Our trust in Him is therefore a confident trust. Don't you want to live with this? For we know that He will not, indeed cannot change. His purposes are unfailing, His promises unassailable. It is because the God who promised us eternal life is immutable. That we may rest assured. And friends, I pray the Holy Spirit of God uses this to pierce your heart and place this truth in you today. It is because this God who promised us eternal life is immutable that we may rest assured that nothing, not trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, shall separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We live and will live in an out-of-control world. And this is not a, a gloom and doom prognosis, but the most likely outcome as we look toward the future is that things will escalate in terms of turbulence and insecurity and uh, the destabilization of our world. But I pray you hear today that though we live in an out-of-control world, there is an in-control God. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of who you are. You have revealed yourself to us through your word and ultimately through the word that became flesh, Jesus Christ. I just pray that we are able to rejoice in this truth of who you are. I pray that this leads us to deeper understanding, but not just for the sake of intellectualizing doctrine apart from life and application, but I pray this would lead us to a deeper understanding so that this would lead us to deeper worship, deeper appreciation, deeper admiration, 
deeper awe, deeper love for you. And that as a result of having a better understanding of who you are, that, that we draw nearer to you. And we understand that there is hope for us to be transformed through the gospel of Jesus, this message that he came, he lived, he died, he rose again. That there's hope for us to be transformed into your image. And I pray today that to the extent that we've looked to other things to be our safer, today we just want to look to you. We pray this in the great name of Jesus. Amen.